Let's talk about the nervous system. You have some nerve. Actually, you have a lot of nerves. And they go through every single portion and touch on every single place in your entire body. And uh, they can make things so easy for the human body to function. But if they go astray, uh uh-oh, they basically, the nervous system is similar to the electrical system of your house or your car, actually, as we look at it now. And we study the nervous system in two parts. There's the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And you may remember from medical terminology, peripheral means the extended part, so arms and legs. And then the central nervous system is the brain headquarters and the spinal cord, which goes from the brain all the way down to approximately the lumbar area. So let's look at this first. I'm sorry to inform you, but your brain, nobody's brain, is actually all of these pretty colors. That would be nice. Could you imagine going to the doctor and saying, I have a headache. And the doctor says, well, where in your head does it hurt? And you say, the green part or the pink part. And then he will call for a psych consult. Okay, no, seriously. Um, This illustration has all the different colors to help you easily identify the different sections of the brain. And this is headquarters or central central, um, operations because the brain does function to control everything in the entire body. And whether it's a direct control, such as activating a nerve or indirect control, this is where it all starts, okay? Now, some people incorrectly use the word brain and the word cerebrum interchangeably, but that is not actually true. The cerebrum is only one part of the brain. And the cerebellum, as you can see on the right side of the screen of this of the slide, the very bottom, that brown and white area is pointing to the cerebellum, different from the cerebrum. Okay. All right. So as you look at the terms used for this, you can see how Um, the terms are very important because they identify the area of the brain, whether it's with regard to a diagnosis or a procedure. Um, And right here on the left side of the screen, the pink part, the kind of first, uh, it says frontal lobe, and that's right here, your forehead. So as you look at this picture, The eyes are to the left and the back of your head, the occipital lobe, the green part is back here, the back part. And now that you are learning these terms, the next time you watch uh, Law and Order or or even um, uh, St. 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 Amsterdam, Amsterdam. (laughs) or any one of either the crime shows or the medical shows, you may come across where they'll say, well, the the patient was hit with a blunt object. Remember the blunt object is always a blunt object. Okay, the blunt object in, in the occipital region, that's the green area, the back of the head. Very common amongst criminals who want to, um, knock the person out and sometimes kill them, okay? But this is what I'm saying is how you can really practice your terminology by paying attention now to shows that you may watch all the time 
and connecting them to the terms used in medical terminology. Okay. And so the next time you're sitting on the couch and you're watching law and order and, and they say, oh, well, he was hit with a blunt object in the occipital region. And you'll go, the occipital region, the back of the head. See, I know it. There you go. Okay. You see how you never know how you can use medical terminology more than for your career and more than as a patient or the loved one of a patient, although you certainly will do that as well. All right. Continuing on now. All right. So we talked about the areas of the brain and they are referred to as lobes. Okay. So the frontal lobe, which is right here, and that is, um, that's kind of your personality and your behavior. And again, as you're watching medical shows, they might talk about somebody who has frontal lobe damage, okay, which interferes with their ability to, to make good judgment calls. Um, it also affects autonomic involuntary. And when you look at autonomic, Okay, think of automatic. Don't say automatic, say autonomic, but it's automatic. That's your involuntary activity of your um, nervous system. Okay, for example, and we may talk about this in a minute, but for example, um, nerves are integrated into your heart and the autonomic, autonomic, nervous system tells your heart contract release contract release contract release that's your heartbeats okay as it pushes the blood flow from one section of the heart ventricle from the atrium to the ventricle the ventricle out into your arteries and that is autonomic as in automatic your nervous system does that without impairment hopefully um, which is a good thing, because could you imagine if you had to, um, if you had to tell your heart to beat, contract, release, contract, release, you wouldn't be able to do anything else. You, you would not be able to do anything else. Okay. The frontal lobe is also um, an area for speech. Okay, and you may have been reading about Bruce Willis. You remember the actor from Die Hard and so many other movies. And um, he has just been diagnosed with dementia and that there is a problem or a defect here in his frontal lobe that it is um, affecting his memory an ability to remember words and what they mean, as well as the ability to say them. And if you remember, we talked about aphasia and aphasia. Remember that in the beginning, aphasia with a G, which is a, uh, a um, late effect or a sequela of a cerebral vascular accident, Okay, aphasia with a G is the inability to swallow, but aphasia with an S, as in speech, is, is an effect where the, the blockage was in the frontal lobe of the brain and affects the patient's ability to connect thoughts with words and then say them, okay? And remember, aphasia with an S is different than a physical reason for inability to speak. And, and again, this brings us back to the details. Remember the details. We always have to ask questions. We have to know, what do you mean by that? because I might have trouble speaking because I have pharyngitis, right? An inflammation of the voice box or laryngitis. 
So if we know that the patient cannot speak, that's not enough information, is the reason for the inability to speak physical having to do with the voice box or is it neurological having to do with the frontal lobe of the brain? It's so one of the things that I love about healthcare is the fact that it's so complex and so specific. It's definitely left brain. Okay. All right. The fish of Rolando, also known as the central sulcus. So take a look at the picture, the illustration on the left-hand side of your screen on the slide, and you'll notice central sul sulcus is directly smack in the middle of the illustration, right under the header, median section of the brain, okay? So the sulcus, um, which may or may not be on your worksheet, may or may not be, but it's a weird word, right? Sulcus, okay? And all it is, is it's just that area in between the lobes of the brain. It's like the, the creation of the brain already pre-sectioned everything, all right? So you don't have to worry about the fact that there are no colors because you have the, the sulcus or the fissure. And I don't know who Rolando is, so don't even ask me. Okay, the parietal lobe, which is next, and you have a right and a left, okay? And these parietal lobes give you the ability to interpret sensory information. So what is sensory is touching and feeling and hearing, okay? And, and yes, and it, it, it was a meme a long time ago, I don't know if you've seen it, that says because the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, only people who are left-handed are in their right mind. It's a play on words, right? It's funny though. And it helps you remember that this is the parietal lobe. And yes, the right parietal lobe processes sensory data from the left side of your, of your body. And the left parietal lobe processes data from the right side. So if you're right, you're left. And if you're right, you're left. That'll help you remember it, right? Right? Right. Okay. Next, we have the fissure of solvius, the lateral sulcus. And that's the line between the temporal lobe and the frontal and the parietal lobe. So it's kind of like a T, a T, T street. Okay. Um, the temporal lobe. And this is why we call this, this is right here. Your temporal lobes are here, which is why you know, you, you know, right, that these are your temples, right? Don't we call this your temples? This is where the temporal lobe is, right here. This is what helps you collect that data, smell, taste, and hearing, as well as your interpretation of spoken language. Oh, spoken language. And you see how that is going to work together with your frontal lobes and how we have all of these parts of the brain sharing responsibility for things that you do literally every moment of every day, okay? And then we have the occipital lobe that processes visual information. Oh, wait. Okay. No, that was it. Okay. So next, we come down the pike and starting at your occipital lobe is the connector cervical vertebrae one, also known as the axis 
connects, and that's exactly where the spinal cord connects to the brain. And you remember when we talked about the skeletal system and we talked about the vertebra and how all of the vertebra had like a hole in the middle, right? Is that hole in the center? Well, that's where the spinal cord, which is basically this big collection of nerves, comes down from the brain all the way to your waist, to the um, lumbar area. It's right around L1, L2. Okay, you remember? when we talked about the skeletal system. So the spinal cord goes down, which is really good because it's, it's protected on all sides by bone. This is good because you don't want that damage to your spinal cord, which is why sometimes you'll find people who get injuries to C1 or C2, because that's right there at the back of your neck it's not really protected by bone. Very, very critical because that's the intersection between the spinal cord and the brain. And you remember that the vertebrae were all referred to by their sections, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, coccyx, right? So you have cervical, C1, C2, et cetera, thoracic T1, T2. Okay. Well, the nerves are referred to in the same way. Thank you very much. You couldn't come up with something different so we could differentiate between the nerves, the reference to the nerves and the reference to the vertebra? No, obviously not. So you have to pay very close attention to the context in which C1 or C3 is being used. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Good. All right. All right. Now the spinal nerves, as I said, are, are located and they kind of come to a, a settling point for each of these sections. And that's how they are referred. And um, as we go through the transition, you'll notice that there are only seven cervical vertebra, but we have eight cervical nerves. And that's because they count as they cross into the first thoracic vertebra. It, the first thoracic vertebra contains the eighth cervical nerve. Oh, great. Again, you don't have to worry about memorizing this, but you do want to have enough familiarization. So as you read the op notes or the physician documentation, you can call the meaning from this. And that's the whole point of you attending this course, right? Okay. Then you have the thoracic nerves. And remember that the thoracic nerves then become intercostal nerves. And you remember intercostal spaces has to do with the spaces between the ribs. And, and um, you want to make certain that you are absolutely understanding what is being referred to. Okay, so we have T1 through T12, 12, 12 pairs of thoracic nerves. Then we have the lumbar nerves, okay? But right there in lumbar L1, L2, we just discussed is the end of the spinal cord. So what about the rest of these nerves, right? And we need nerves going down into your legs so you can feel things, right? And, and of course, we know that there are nerves at your coccyx, because if you've ever fallen down on your butt, you certainly have felt that pain. And of course, nerve endings are what give you that pain. So what we have here is at the end of the spinal cord around L1, L2 is 
the cauda equina. And that is where the, the cord technically ends and the nerves branch off individually to the left and the right. And it's called cauda equina because it looks just like a horse's tail. And that's exactly what cauda equina is Latin, cauda tail, right? You learned that. And equina horse. It looks just like a horse's tail. And I apologize that I don't have a picture of it. But look in your book because there is a picture of it. And that right there at L1 and L2, where the, the spinal cord branches out into those individual, um, the individual nerve endings that then go down into your legs, okay? And is your thoracic nerves that go into your arms. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about the peripheral nervous system because we're there, right? And your peripheral nervous system have what are called plexuses, plexi, plexuses. And this is the point at which from off of the spinal cord, the nerves then branch out to do other things, okay? So you have your third cervical plexus, uh, C1 to C4 and C5 to T1, your brachial plexus. And that is where your nerves are branching out into your arms. And then of course your lumbosacral plexuses, T12 through S5, also referred to as the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus, but you already knew that because lumbosacral is one of those words you can take apart. Isn't that cool? Okay. And these, these nerves are then attached to their own sections of the nervous system in the brain. And these are known as your cranial nerves. And your cranial nerves are also numbered. And again, as you look into your future, it will, of course, depend on where you are going to be working and what you're going to be doing. All right. If you're going to go work for a neurologist, after a short amount of time, this will become second nature to you. However, remember that there are all these different aspects of the nervous system and what the nervous system does. Now, even if you if you work for a um, a family practitioner, there may be some of this, but not to this extent. So I don't want you to get all freaked out about all of these words, but again, some of them are going to be familiar with you to you, such as the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve, which you know optic has to do with eyes and seeing, because when you go to the eye doctor, the eye doctor is an ophthalmologist, optic, op, and then you may need glasses, and then you have to go to an optician who makes glasses. You see how it all starts with the same prefix or the same root? I guess that would be the root, okay? All right, so as you look at these and you are learning your prefixes, your roots and your suffixes and you collect this with other terms that you know, such as glossopharyngeal, glossopharyngeal, remember the pharynx is there and glosso refers to the tongue, all right? And vestibulocochlear nerve, which is nerve number eight. Have you heard of a cochlear implant? Mm-hmm. And the vestibule of your ear? Nerve number eight has to do with hearing, okay? You can totally do this. And how are you gonna do it? 
you're going to review this, review this, review this. Okay. And like I said, I want you to pay attention to the TV shows you watch and recognize those terms and reinforce those terms or use them with your family. Okay. Um, whatever you need, but the repetition, the repetition, that is what is going to work best for you. Now, again, depending upon where you're going with this knowledge. Certainly right now, I want you to use a medical dictionary because as you are reinforcing these terms into your brain, I need you to make sure you are reinforcing accurate explanations, accurate definitions, all right? And what are you going to do when you have a question, when you're confused? What are you going to do? Who are you going to call? You're going to query me. Now, on the job, federal law says you query the doctor. Yes, that's not rude. That's good. Uh, well, you don't want to be, you could be rude, but I don't want you to be rude. I want you to make sure that you are paying attention. This is so incredibly important. OK, so when you have a question, when you're confused, you're going to email me at safiansc at cctech.edu. Not the other one, not the myccctech.cctech.da-da-da. No, because that's going to the third ring of Saturn and I will never see it. So therefore, you email me here, safiansc. We'll email back and forth. I'll answer you. You can print it out and use it as a study guide, or we can make an appointment. We can talk on the phone. We can Skype. We can Zoom. We can FaceTime. Whatever works. I'm here to support you and your success. Any questions? Okie dokie, then. I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the week and the weekend. And... I'll see you next week.